Christmas is a time for cozying up in front of a roaring fire with family and friends. With gifts for receiving and giving. A time to eat, drink and be merry and overindulge a little. For those of you who are a more religious among us, it's a spiritual time of year, a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. However you spend your time, our Christmas has changed dramatically over the centuries. It's morphed, polished and centred into a commercial wonderland of craziness. But it's still my favourite holiday. Hi everybody and welcome back to the Dark Histories podcast. Hope everybody is well. I'm Rob, your host as always. So we're here, episode 23 and the last in this season and of this year. I'm going to start with a couple of apologies before we continue. So first of all, this episode is late as I've just got over Covid. I was unwell for the first week and then the second week my voice just wasn't right so I decided to delay this episode for a couple of days so I could give it my all. Secondly, I've had a bit of a mix up with my podcast distributor. Seems I put some episodes up for subscription only when I realised my mistake. They were unpublished so I had to republish them and now the sequence is all out of whack. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. For episode 23, I thought I would change it up a little. Being the time of year and all, I didn't really want to spread doom and gloom, but I also didn't want to go too far off topic, so I decided to have a look at some of Christmas folklores from around the world. There's still a modicum of death and destruction, but this week, I tied it in a bow. So please, sit back and relax for more Dark History. For centuries in Britain, there was a tradition, now largely forgotten, of whiling away the long Christmas nights by huddling around the hearth and telling ghost stories. Many ancient pagan festivals of winter, such as Yule, feature death and the supernatural, and these two were times of the year where families and communities would come together and tell stories. This endured and evolved over the centuries, And in the 17th century, Robert Burton listed a merry tales of witches, fairies and goblins as a popular Christmas pastime. But the yarns weren't always jolly, and the traditions of wise and old crones frightening children with scary stories is an ancient and widespread one. The Barbus of Elizabethan playwright Christopher Marlowe speaks of an old woman telling winter tales of spirits and ghosts that glide by night. But it was Charles Dickens with his famous 1843 ghost story, A Christmas Carol, as well as M.R. James who really helped to cement the popular association between the supernatural and Christmas. Many Victorians believed in haunted houses and the presence of spirits. Dickens himself is reputed to appear in phantom form every year outside the Corn Exchange in Rochester, seen there at midnight on Christmas Eve, set in the hands of his watch. One such story that happened in London in 1887 sees two sailors, Blunden and Martin, who were on leave on Christmas Eve. They trawled the gloomy and foggy streets that cold evening looking for lodging and they happened upon 50 Berkeley Square, and were pleased to find a room there for the night. The murderous haunted house had previously claimed a victim in the room in which they stayed. Blunden felt uneasy in the darkness and couldn't sleep. In the middle of the night, he frantically woke up Martin, in time to see a dark spectre looming towards them. Blunden went for a weapon, and the apparition darted towards him. Meanwhile, The bleary had Martin escaped to the streets and found a bobby on the beat. The navy man returned to the house with the cop and, to their horror, they saw Blunden at the bottom of the stairs, dead. His neck was broken and his eyes and mouth were wide open, as though he had died from fear. A Christmas tradition from South Wales sees people making hobby horses out of hooded horse skulls decked out in ribbons, bells and baubles. The Mary Lloyd roams the streets of Welsh towns between Christmas and the Twelfth Night, 
A knock at the door might result in a challenge of rhymes or song. Translated as the Grey Mare, Mary Lloyd, his tradition whose origins are unknown, although most believe it dates long before Christianity. When the groups get to the house, they sing Welsh language songs or wassails, or more traditionally, indulge in exchange of rude rhymes with the person who lived there. If the Mary and her gang get entry, the household is said to have good luck for the year. The Mary is well known to be mischievous, trying to steal things and chase people she likes, as she goes about her bidding. The modern Christmas is a fusion of traditions from many cultures and has both Christianity. The modern Christmas is a fusion of traditions from many cultures and has both Christian and pre-Christian elements. One of the most prevailing being Yule. To some, Yule was and still is considered a holy period. Like other winter solstice holidays, it celebrates the promise of light again triumphing over darkness and the rebirth of the sun. During the Viking era, Yule is known as a time in which family and friends would strengthen their ties to each other through hospitality, feasting, drinking, gift giving and making merry in the face of the privation and dangers of winter. It was also when all the gods were honoured, especially Odin, who is also referred to as Yule Father. Now, what has the raven-flanked Norse god of war got to do with Christmas? Well, the Vikings and other northern European people believe that Odin raced across the windy night sky, leading his pack of gods, elves, beasts and ancestral spirits in a great hunt against the ice giants and the forces of darkness. This wild hunt, as it was often called, was linked to winter storms and dangerous omens. While the wild hunt was on, those who provoked the ire of the gods could find themselves caught in bad luck and Odin's wrath, while those who Odin favoured would receive good fortune and gifts. Though the wild hunt could happen at any winter's night, it was especially associated with the twelve nights of Yule. Sticking in Scandinavia, the country of Iceland probably has the most terrifying Christmas folklore. The idea of Santa is very different to the ones we know and love in the modern western cultures. Rather than imagining a jolly bearded man in red and white, the Santa of Iceland are 13 filthy trolls led by their mother, a child-eating giantess named Grela. The story of the Yule lads and Grela has terrified the children in Iceland for centuries. So much so the Icelandic government banned parents from telling it in 1746. From the 11th of December to the 24th, the Yule lads run around the country causing mischief. But Grela, their mother, is one of the most evil figures in Icelandic folklore, and horror stories about her are still told to children over the festive season. Throughout the year, It is said that she collects the whispers about children around the island misbehaving. And when winter sets in, she sets out to gather them. Her appetite for the flesh of naughty youths is insatiable, and each year she finds no shortage of her favourite crop. Collecting them up in a sack, she then cooks them in a pot and turns them into a giant stew that will sustain her until the next winter. Grayla would be terrible enough if she worked alone. But sadly for Icelandic children, she does not. She shares her mountain cave in North Iceland with an enormous black feline called the Christmas cat, which also has an appetite for human flesh. The Christmas cat, however, doesn't just seek out those who have misbehaved. It happily preys on any child that didn't get new clothes for Christmas. A more famous Christmas folklore tale comes from Germany, and that is of the Krampus. The Germans don't mess around when it comes to bad behaviour. According to the modern stories, on December 5th, St Nicholas Eve, jolly old St Nick leaves candy and gifts in children's shoes, while Krampus tags behind and gives out punishment to those who misbehave. So while St Nicholas visits on Christmas Eve, 
Ancient creatures of Europe's forests and mountains play a hand in teaching young children how to be on their best behaviour. This devilish looking half goat, half man creature with dark shaggy hair, horns, fangs and cloven hooves is derived from the German word Krampen, which translates to claw. Krampus has actually been a part of the seasonal story since pre-Germanic traditions and held his own despite an initial push to banish this pagan emblem from a now Christian celebration. The tradition that St Nicholas leaves coal to naughty children is nothing compared to Krampus's job. For more serious offenders he would swat them with birch sticks or stuff them into his sack to take them away to hell. Bell's Nickel was another helpful character of German folklore to St Nicholas. Although, instead of accompanying him on his rounds, this fur-clad and short-tempered man visited children beforehand to whip them into shape. Instead of sneaking down the chimney, Bell's Nickel rapped on the windows and shook his bells, carrying a sack with candy in one hand and a switch in the other. Even though children often proclaim that they've been good all year, he'd ask them to recite a poem or a Bible verse and those who would stumble or behave badly were whacked with the stick to remind them to change their ways. Originating in southwestern Germany, France and Swiss regions, the tradition of Belsnickel followed immigrants to Pennsylvanian Dutch communities in the New World, where they still celebrate this slightly terrifying character. Another of Germany's terrifying Christmas folklore characters is Frau Pachetta, on the last three Thursdays before Christmas, it is believed that Frau Pachetta flies through the air on her wild hunt with demon-like creatures and lost souls for her companions. Virtually unknown in the West, this witch of Christmas originates from German-Austrian regions dating back centuries prior to the arrival of Christians. With the appearance of a ragged old crone complete with the long hooked nose, she has a right frightful face which is well to heed, as pachetta means business. If someone behaves well, they receive a silver coin as a reward. But for unruly children, or even women who didn't keep a tidy home or still had unsprung flax from their twelfth night, she'd cut open their abdomen with the long knife she kept underneath her skirt and replace their innards with pebbles or straw. As you may have guessed by now, Christmas throughout history goes hand in hand with terrifying and gruesome characters but surely there is one person that can shed light on all this darkness well yes there is i hear you cry a jolly old saint nicholas the child-friendly man who is most famous for protecting children unfortunately poor saint nick has some truly awful stories attached to him one he's the patron saint of prostitutes and according to legend Three young students were travelling on their way to school and were looking for a place to spend the night. They find an inn run by a butcher and his wife, who sees the boy's fat wallet and gets some bad ideas. While the boys slept, the butcher killed them, chopped them up, and put the dismembered bodies into a pickling barrel. Before they know it, however, there comes a knock at the door, This time, they're greeted by a regal-looking bishop who demands fresh meat for dinner. When the butcher replies he doesn't have any fresh meat, the bishop, St Nicholas, insists he has the freshest meat of all and demands he opens the pickling tub. Nicholas prays over the tub, and instead of loose body parts spilling over the floor, three whole, fully alive boys come out, who gives thanks to St Nicholas and God and then makes their way home. In France, it's said that Nicholas subsequently put the butcher in chains and forced him into servitude to make penance for his crime, and his name was Pierre Foutard. In St Nick's service, Foutard hands out lumps of coal, and according to tradition, a beating or a whipping. Foutard's appearance is described to be an older man, with a sinister face. He wears a dark robe, has an unkempt black beard and carries a whip or a club. His face is also usually darkened with soot. 
Well, that was the Christmas special. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I said I wanted to stay away from doom and gloom, but I don't think I did that. I think I did quite the opposite. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I wanted to change things up a little bit with this and speak about all the traditions. Anyway, if you liked it, please drop us a review. It really does help the podcast out. If you think friends and family may like this, then share it with them. Links to TikTok, YouTube, Insta, the show email and Twitter are below. If you've been listening for a while, why don't you subscribe? Please do it, then you never miss an episode. As I said at the top of this, this is the last episode for season one and this year. I'm going to take a break over Christmas and figure out what I want to do moving forward. So there won't be an episode until the start of January. I want to thank everybody who's discovered this podcast, who viewed it and listened to it throughout this first year. I know it sounds like a platitude, but I really do appreciate everyone who listens, downloads and follows this podcast. You honestly don't know. I still think it's crazy that people actually want to listen to me waffle on about random stuff in history. Anyway, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you all. If Christmas isn't your bag, I hope however you spend your time over this festive period is good and safe. So with all that out the way, please join me for the start of Season 2 in January and more dark history.